And now an update on the day's top news stories. I'm Lewis Waters. Police are appealing for the public's help to trace a man wanted in connection with the rape of a 15-year-old girl. The 15-year-old girl was held at knife point during the assault. Thousands of people are at risk of harm or even murder due to widespread police failure to tackle domestic abuse. Greater Manchester Police have been criticised by government inspectors for failing to protect victims. A report identified that urgent action is required. Chief Constable for GMP Sir Peter Fay has called the report unfair and said the and said the court and the police powers need to change. A satellite from Thailand has detected 300 new objects in the southern Indian Ocean while searching for the Malaysian missing Malaysian plane. The objects were said to be scattered over the area of the southwest of Perth. The search has been suspended this morning due to bad weather. Barack Obama has met Pope Francis in Rome for the first time in his European tour. The president has been meeting with the European leaders in a bid to settle the disruption in Ukraine. A court in Turkey has ordered a review of the Twitter ban. The Telecommunication Authority has 30 days to decide whether to remove the restriction. The Turkish Prime Minister said he would wipe out the last Twitter of last week after news of government corruption spread worldwide. And now, over to Helen for the weather. The easterly front means that most of the UK is going to be stuck with rainstorms throughout the afternoon. Over the weekend, a warmer front should bring some nicer weather. The south coast will see the best of the weather this afternoon, and apart from a few scattered showers, they should manage to stay nice and dry. Mull will also see some sunny conditions. The rain will ease up for most of the places, but in the north it will become more continuous with showers expected overnight. Temperatures will be around 3 or 4 degrees and there is only a low chance of frost. So we are now heading over to San Francisco. It's raining there but in, Calif in California, but in other parts, it is in, like Los Angeles, it is a little bit nicer. So over to San Francisco State University, where it is rainy and overcast. Welcome to State of Events. I'm Victoria Alanese. And I'm Suzette Reynoso. Our top story, Mayor Jean Kwan is ready to change Oakland for the better. She wants a more diverse and enriched city. Her latest residential plan proposes bringing in thousands of new residents. Talia Samelian has the details. Mayor Jean Kwan has big plans for the city of Oakland. The second major area I want to talk to you about is building the prosperity in the city for everyone. It is no secret that Oakland is booming right now. Mayor Kwan says she wants to bring 10,000 new residents to Oakland and build them 7,500 units throughout the city. Her proposal is an extension of former Mayor Jerry Brown's 10K plan, which is credited with fueling the city's restaurant and bar boom in Oakland's uptown and downtown areas. I'm here at City Hall where Oakland Mayor Jean Kwan gave her city address. Mentioning her 10K2 residential plan, Kwan wants to revitalize the city and create affordable housing. By bringing in residents to the city, Kwan believes the public transit system will prosper. We're hoping that in our 10K2 that the buildings and the homes will be in all parts of the city, particularly along our transit corridors where we'll be able to get some state funding for affordable housing. So that would be International Boulevard, that would be San Pablo, Telegraph, it would be at each of the BART stations where we could build transit villages similar to the Fruitvale station. BART spokeswoman Luna Salaver had high praise for the mayor's proposal. Anytime you have a high density project near a BART station, it's a triple win. It's good for the environment, great for local economy, and it 
improves your life as an individual. Urban studies and planning professor Pietro Calagero had several concerns about the 10K2 plan. Very careful about is what sort of protections are in place both for tenants and also for longtime owners in, in the area. I make a commitment that we're going to try to make sure that at least 25% of those new homes are also affordable. I don't think by most people's estimate that they're going to be affordable. Uh, I think that you can do a technical definition of what affordability means. In Oakland, I'm Talia Samalian, State of Events. West Coast weather could be getting even more wet and wild than the recent storms in Southern California. The National Oceanic, Atmospheric and Administration has issued an El Nino watch. The NOAA warns that an increase in wind and the jet streams over the southern U.S. can possibly create severe tornadoes and thunderstorms. We saw El Ninos before in 1997 and 1998. With El Nino, wetter conditions are often dealt to the west coast, which could help California's drought. As of now, the El Nino Southern Oscillation is in a neutral phase. There is about a 50% chance that it will fully develop this summer or fall. We sure don't feel any change in weather yet. Many areas are still suffering from drought. Our Central Valley correspondent is a few hours south of Tulare, finding out about how the drought is affecting our local crops and dairy products. Let's hear from Kaylee now. Well, I'm here in Tulare, California, a town that's considered an agricultural mecca and part of California's breadbasket. The drought is hitting especially hard here, as you can see by this empty canal that I'm standing in. And although we did experience some rain here earlier in the day, officials have informed me that it would take heavy storming to provide some sort of relief for California's current drought situation. In the city of Tulare, a major food and dairy source for California and the world, water is far from taken for granted. The drought has made national headlines this year, but dairyman Mark Waddy has informed me that the shortened water supply has been a long time coming. There will, there will for sure be no surface supply this year. We had zero supply last year. And the year before, three years ago, we had a very limited amount. Should the rest of us care about Central California's water supply? Definitely, says Mark. When we, when we farm this ground, when we take water, soil, and sun and interact those three and create, whether it be cotton, cattle feed, pistachio, whatever we do, we, we, create, we create wealth. We have the safest, cheapest food in the world here. Water distributors agree. A water district manager says that the future for water, as of now, looks dismally dry. Because the system that is in place today was designed for the population that was here in the 80s. So since the 80s, we're just stretching the existing system farther and farther and farther mm -hmm. without developing any new supplies or infrastructure. Dealing with the water on their hands now leaves not much to deal with at all. But how we're going to deal with this this year with no water, uh, I don't know. So, but uh, this is uh, one of the worst drought times, if not the worst drought time that, since we've had recorded history. I've noticed a change in mood in the folks of Tulare today. The earlier rain seems to have provided some temporary relief. As far as a long-term solution, however, those questions are still left unanswered. I'm Kaylee Hendricks here in Tulare, California with State of Events. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Kaylee. And continuing our team coverage of the drought is Suzette Reynoso. She's talked to a few local wineries to find out the drought's impact on what Northern California is known around the world for. It's Vino. That water would be out of business. Bob Sorensen checks the forecast every morning, hoping to get some rain coming his way. We've had uh, less than an inch of rainfall here. Normally this time of year, I would have anywhere from 12 to 18 inches. As vineyard manager of Winte Winery in Livermore, California, his biggest challenge is keeping the crop alive. For the first time in the history of the winery, Bob turned on the irrigation system in January to make up for the lack of rain, something that is usually not necessary until spring. No one's ever turned their water on in January. That's unheard of. The grapes are starting to come out too early, and if the dry conditions continue, the vineyard can lose up to half of their this crop. This is a good three weeks earlier than normal. 
The challenge with this is for, not only is it earlier and it's dry and I have to add more irrigation, but there's still a possibility we might get some late season rains. But with that late season rains, I have an increased chance of frost. When I get a frost, I'm gonna lose all these. So what does this mean for wine consumers? Well, with the $300 million aid by President Obama, farmers will be able to save their crops. So this means consumers can still enjoy their glass of their favorite vino. In Alameda, I'm Suzette Reynoso, State of Events. And when you've had too much wine, a new restroom system in Dolores Park will make it easier to pee. San Francisco is installing a custom-made open-air urinal calling the Pee Pod. A seven-foot-tall semi-cylinder screen will surround a drowned connector to the sewer system. The Park and Rec project manager says Dolores Park welcomes more than 5,000 people any given weekend, which has caused their previous restrooms to become less usable. Each pea pod runs about $15,000, which is part of the overall $14 million park restoration. And plastic water bottles could be a thing of the past. At least in San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors unanimously passed an or ordinance banning the sale of water bottles 21 ounces or less would be prohibited at any indoor or outdoor event. One more vote and the measure will go to the mayor's desk to be signed into law. Pedestrian safety in San Francisco is taking a few steps forward. This year alone, five pedestrians have been killed in San Francisco. City leaders are starting to take notice and action. A pedestrian safety plan called Walk First is being implemented by San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee. The plan called Walk First will span over five years to target the city's most dangerous intersections. $17 million is being committed to street construction, including better lighting and new paint jobs. But critics say $240 million is needed to fulfill the plan. Coming up on the, miss on the update, missing Malaysian plane and the latest on international search and rescue efforts. And Facebook drones, what the social media giant hopes to do with solar-powered flying machines. Stay tuned. What if we could make a difference with every cup of coffee we drink? With Fairtrade certified coffee, we can. Look for this label where you buy your coffee. Energy costs for small businesses rose over 40% in 2001. Stop wasting your money. Let the Smart Lights program help you. Call us today at 510-981-8955 or visit our website at smartlights.org. Smart Lights, brighten your bottom line. It may be getting tougher to get into college. The College Board says the SAT exam is more difficult. There will be more complex questions, but the essay section will now be optional. The Board says the purpose is to make it more fair for people of any socioeconomic status. There is a lot of mystery and unrest around the world tonight. Nikki Pena is here to unravel the latest. Nikki? Thanks, Suzette. The search for the missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 continues. The Boeing 777 was heading to Beijing, China when it left from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia on March 8th. The aircraft went off the grid somewhere between Malaysia and Vietnam, a distance equivalent to the size of the state of Pennsylvania. The missing aircraft was carrying 227 passengers and 12 crew members. And since then, many theories on what happened to the airplane started to unfold. And there's even speculation of the disappearance being a possible terrorist attack. But still, with no signs of the missing aircraft, the international search for Flight 370 continues as the families continue to hold candlelight vigils and pray for the passengers. An American anchor in Russia made headlines after resigning on air. The video of anchor woman Liz Wall went viral after she resigned from her position at a Russian television station. She says it's due to her own, due to her own ethical beliefs between Russia and Ukraine. And that is why, personally, I cannot be part of a network funded by the Russian government that whitewashes the actions of Putin. I'm proud to be an American 
and believe in disseminating the truth. And that is why, after this newscast, I'm resigning. The issue hits close to home for Wall because her own grandparents were immigrants who fled Hungary during the Soviet era. However, many people are voicing their opinions on social media, claiming Wall's live broadcast was a self-promotion stunt. The crisis in Ukraine continues and leaders met to try to figure out a solution. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and other foreign ministers from around the world met in Paris and their discussion was focused to resolve the conflict between the two nations. We agreed to continue intense discussions in the coming days with Russia, with the Ukrainians, in order to see how we can help normalize the situation stabilize it and overcome the crisis. Kerry says they're determined to find a way to reach a peaceful end to the crisis and that it's up to Russia to de-escalate the situation. I'm Nikki Pena with your World Update. Coming up after the break, Austin Stanley breaks down what you need to know about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And Barbie's put on a few pounds, an artist's new take on the iconic doll. I want to talk to you about Fairtrade Certified Coffee. Fairtrade Certified Coffee guarantees that you get the highest quality gourmet coffee beans you've grown to love. But better yet, it ensures that family farmers all over the world who grow Fairtrade Coffee get a fair deal for their hard work. So the next time you go to buy coffee, look for the Fairtrade label. Because a little change makes a lot of sense. Look for the label wherever you buy coffee. sale at bookstores and newsstands near you. Experience Theater Bay Area Magazine. Before the break, Nikki Benya brought you up to date with what's going on in the Ukraine crisis. Now, Austin Stanley is here to explain the history and the details behind the Ukrainian conflict. Thanks, Suzette. With all the talk of World War III going around, we decided to give you some context on what's happening in Ukraine. The government of Ukraine formed after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. For the last 20 years, Ukrainian politics has been a struggle between joining Western Europe while relying on Russia for all of its gas. It was the most recent president, Viktor Yanukovych's decision to not sign an agreement with the European Union that started the protests you saw on TV. Ukrainians say the contract was the straw that broke the camel's back. They accuse Yanukovych of making himself rich while their country struggled after the 2008 financial collapse. They also say he gave in to pressures from Russia, who starved Ukraine of gas before. So why does Russia care if Ukraine joins the EU? Well, Russian gas and oil pipelines that supply Europe run through Ukraine. EU membership may also end Russia's ability to store its Black Sea naval fleet in Crimea. Now here is where Crimea gets involved. During Ukraine's Soviet years, Russia gave it control over the Crimean Peninsula, which is attached to mainland Ukraine. Crimea is a republic, a semi-autonomous country, one controlled by the Ukraine, but that elects its own parliament. Almost 60% of its population are Russian. These are the people Russia says it's protecting with its military. The United States and Europe are against Russia in Crimea because they consider it a part of Ukraine. But Crimeans recently voted to join Russia. So the question now is, does the semi-autonomous country with its own elected officials get to choose what country it belongs to? Talks between the United States and Russia are currently frozen. Uh, Senator uh, Kerry decided that he was not going to meet with Putin today. Um, and with that, it's uh, back to you guys. And coming up next, where you can find the luck of the Irish this weekend. Even common daily routines can make important changes. Changes like higher wages, better living, and justice. Sometimes it's just a matter of making the right choice. Fair Trade certified coffees are bought directly from family farmers, guaranteeing them better incomes and strengthening their communities. Fair Trade certified. Taste fairness.
Look for the label wherever you buy coffee. Before City Car Share, we were spending a lot of money on gas and insurance. I felt like I had to check my bank account every time I went driving. City Car Share is great because the membership includes insurance and a gas card. I don't even know why we owned a car in the Bay Area. Now we just have more money to spend on other things. City Car Share is an important part of our lives. City Car Share gives you the benefits of using a car. Without the hassle of owning one. And now we turn to Vanessa Navares with the latest and greatest in the tech world. Vanessa? Let the internet sky wars begin. Facebook wants to buy drone maker company Titan Aerospace for $60 million. The solar powered dro drones operate in the stratosphere for years without refueling. The buy would allow Facebook to achieve its project to make parts of the world that are offline online. Drones would bring Wi-Fi hotspots to two-thirds of the world that don't have internet access. Facebook is now competing with the Google's Loon project. Google deploys giant balloons into the stratosphere and beam down Wi-Fi to remote regions of the world. Forgot to vote in the last election or don't know what measures are on the ballot, a new app could help you help you to civic engagement mobile app that launched last November. It lets people do their civic duty more easily by voting at the touch of their phone. Founder and CEO Rod Macy made the free iOS app to motivate the apathetic voter to get more engaged. Now registered voters can keep up on politicians' voting records and stay informed of current issues. Do you dare to unplug? The National Day of Unplugging promotes people to sign a pledge to unplug for 24 hours from all electronic devices. It's held in March every year. The nonprofit organization Reboot started the Digital Sabbath. They're partnered with the Ad Council, Digital Detox, and even Google. Pure Research says almost all adults have cell phones, almost half sleep next to their phone. 67% check their phone for messages, even though it's not ringing. It may be hard for most of us to unplug, but it's to create awareness of how much we interact with electronics and the impact it has on family, friends, and mental health. Next week, I'll bring you more on the day of unplugging events held in San Francisco. This is Vanessa Navares with the Tech Report. Thank you, Vanessa. Up next, Kyle Nietzsche is here, and we're talking about what's going on this weekend. Hey, Kyle. Thank you, ladies. I'm here to get you excited for the weekend. If you've got a hot date coming up, then consider a fun night with the San Francisco Ballet. That's right, Cinderella is back by popular demand. Enjoy spectacular sets, beautiful costumes, and special effects. Last year, Cinderella sold out before opening, so reserve your tickets now. And if ballet isn't your thing, then how about switching your dancing shoes for running shoes? San Francisco's Color Run is a fun run dubbed the happiest 5K on the planet. So grab a tutu, a white shirt, and your friends, and head out to Candlestick Park. Sign up online for the Color Run in San Francisco. After you showered off, make your way downtown to Civic Center and enjoy a St. Patrick's Day parade. Immediately following the parade, stick around in front of City Hall for a traditional Irish festival with exhibitions, beverages, food, and Irish dancing. For information on any of these events, check out your local listings for times and prices. For Weekend Update, I'm Kyle Nitchie. Thanks, Kyle. And we're going to leave you with this story. Barbie is getting a make under by a U.S. artist. The controversy over Barbie dolls has inspired a Pittsburgh artist to create a more realistic doll. Nicolet Lamb created Lamely, a new lifelike doll with more relatable proportions than those of the original Barbie. Lamb used data from the Center for Disease Control website in order to create an average 19-year-old American woman's body type. Lamely is shorter, wider, proportioned, flat-footed, and has bendable joints and dresses in casual clothing. The new doll will hit stores in November just in time for the holiday season. Oh, that's so great. I can't wait to buy my niece one of those. I wish they had those when we were growing I up. I know. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, uh, thank you so much for watching State of Events. I'm Suzette Reynoso. Make sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.